One of the most infamous psychological studies ever conducted was the Stanford Prison Experiment. It's mentioned in almost every Intro to Psychology textbook. They tend to focus on how unethical it was and are less critical of its supposed conclusion. August 14, 1971, Palo Alto, California. Twelve young men are rounded up from their homes by police, placed under arrest, and brought to a makeshift prison in the basement of Stanford University. It all begins as a study on the psychology of prison life, led by Stanford psychology professor Dr. Philip Zimbardo. Twenty-four volunteers, twelve guards, and twelve prisoners have agreed to spend the next two weeks recreating life in a correctional facility. The prisoners are booked and stripped nude. They're no longer individuals, forced to wear smocks, stocking caps, and shackles, identified only by their prisoner numbers. Are evolved into a confrontation. Guards showing the prisoners who's boy. The guards quickly adapt to their new profession. Given anonymity by their mirrored sunglasses, some of them start to control the meager food rations, restrict prisoners' bathroom use, and, as tensions rise, so do their cruel methods. Within just six days of the planned two-week study, conditions are so bad that the entire operation is shut down. The study makes international headlines. Zimbardo's fame skyrockets, and his conclusions are taught to students worldwide, used as a defense in criminal trials, and are even submitted to Congress to explain the abuses inflicted at Abu Ghraib. The study brings up a question just as important then as it is today. Is evil caused by the environment or the personalities in it? Zimbardo's shocking conclusion is that when people feel anonymous, and have power over depersonalized others, they can easily become evil, and it occurs more often than we'd like to admit. But while it's true that people were mean to each other during the Stanford prison experiment, what if what truly caused that behavior wasn't what we've always been told? The flaws in the experiment that Ben and other critics bring up call into question large portions of the narrative surrounding the study. So I want to hear from someone who was actually there. Come on. Get in that crowd, then. Four months to next, you're going to be in there for a while. So get used to it. Dave Eshelman, the study's most infamous guard, agreed to tell me his side of the story. It's really an honor to meet you. You're a living, walking piece of psychology history. I'm never recognized in the street or anything like that, although I still get some hate mail. Uh, but Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But what do you say to them when they react that way? I say, well, there's there's probably a lot about that that uh, didn't happen quite the way it's been portrayed. Well, Dave, before we go too far, I'd like to watch the footage we have here so we can kind of talk about what we see. That's me there, by the way. Look at that look. Mm -hmm. So how did you get involved with a Stanford prison experiment? My father is a professor at Stanford. And I was home for summer looking for a summer job. So I'm looking through the want ads, $15 a day. You know, in 1971, that wasn't bad. The way it was introduced to the guards, the whole concept of this experiment, we were never led to believe that we were part of the experiment. We were led to believe that our job was to get results from the prisoners, that they were the ones the researchers are really studying. The researchers were behind the wall, uh, and we all knew they were filming, and we can often hear the researchers commenting on the action from the other side of the wall. You know, like, oh gosh, did you see that? Here, just make sure you get a close-up of that, okay? So if they want to show that prison is a bad experience, I'm going to make it bad. But how did you feel doing stuff like that? Didn't you feel bad? I don't know if this is a revelation to you, but 18-year-old boys are not the most sensitive creatures. Sure. My agenda was to be the worst guard I could possibly be. And it's pretty serious. Mm -hmm. It harms me. I mean harms. I mean, in the present tense, it harms me. How did it harm me? This is my favorite part of all the footage we have from the experiment. Mm -hmm. It's you and a prisoner confronting each other after 
the experiment. I remember the guy saying, I, I hate you, man. Yeah. I hate you. How does it harm you? Just the thing it, it, mean that people can be like that? It, yeah. It let me in on some knowledge that that I've never experienced firsthand. Uh, uh, I didn't see where it was really harmful. It was degrading, and that was that was part of my particular little experiment to see how I could. Uh, Your particular it, little experiment. Yeah, Why I was running, tell me about that. I was I was running little experiments of my own. Each day, I said, "Well, what can we do to ramp up what we did yesterday? How can we build on that? Why did you want to ramp things up?" Two reasons, I think. One was because I really believed I was helping the researchers with some better understanding of, of human behavior. On the other hand, it was personally interesting to me. You know, I cannot say that I, you know, did not enjoy what I was doing. Maybe, you know, having so much uh, power over these poor defenseless prisoners, you know, maybe, you know, you kind of get off on that a little bit. You weren't entirely following a script from a director. Right. But you also felt like Zimbardo wanted something from you. Yes. And you gave that to him. I believe I did. I think I decided I was going to do a better job than anybody there of delivering what he wanted. But does that excuse me from what I was doing? Certainly it started out with me playing a role. So the question is, was there a point where I stopped acting and I started living, so to speak? The standard narrative is that Dave Eshelman did what he did because when people are given power, it's easier than we think for abuse to happen. That may be true, but how predisposed to aggression was Dave? I mean, he signed up to something called a prison study, after all. Also, his feeling that cruelty was encouraged and helped the experiment may have affected his behavior. What I'd like to see is... In the absence of outside influence, can anonymity, power, and depersonalization alone lead to evil? To answer that question, I'd like to design a demonstration of my own. So I'm meeting with Dr. Jared Bartles of William Jewell College, a psychologist who has written extensively about the Stanford Prison Experiment and how it is taught. I would love to do the Stanford Prison Experiment again. You could probably make it more ethical, but still find the same conclusions. That's my hypothesis. I absolutely think it's worthwhile. It's important. It's interesting. Probably the best approach is eliminate as, as best as possible the demand characteristics by eliminating that prisoner guard dynamic. Why do we even need to call one group guards and one prisoners? There's a lot of expectations around those roles. Oh, I'm a guard? I guess I should act like a guard. Yeah, you're right. The, the cover story is really important, and you want to hide the, the true uh, purpose of the experiment. Another piece of this is the role of personality and personality traits. So the original ad in the Stanford study asked for participants for a study of prison life. Mm. You know, that's going to draw certain people that were more kind of disposed to aggression. Because they saw the word prison and thought, I want to be a part of that. Exactly. So when you get a group of kind of authoritarian-minded individuals together, not surprisingly, they're going to create an authoritarian regime and environment. So for whatever it is that we're going to do, we should evaluate the personalities of the individuals. Right. So how do we give people every opportunity to be as evil as they can. I think you have to have those elements that were assumed to be influential in, in the Stanford study. What are those elements? You have to have the depersonalization, you have to have anonymity, you have to have some power differences. Can we elicit some surprising behaviors in just a number of hours? If you kind of come back to the Stanford study, there wasn't anything dramatic that happened in the first day of the study. Yeah. It was the second day of the study when the guards started, started to assert their authority. That came about because of prisoners testing right. and challenging the, right. the guards' authority. Yeah, and that led to fear that, like, wait a second, these prisoners need to be put more in check. Yeah, yeah. So I think you still need that provocation. Yeah. Something that is frustrating, something that's going to increase the participant's arousal. Right. All right, so Jared, would you like to spend some time now brainstorming a new design 
that peeks into the same questions. Absolutely. Awesome. Jared and I sat down with the Minefield crew to begin the planning process. Will a person without any expectations or pushes in a certain direction still be abusive or not? For this demonstration, we want to eliminate all outside variables and really isolate the three core elements of the Stanford Prison Experiment. The first element is anonymity. Subjects need to believe that no matter how they behave, no one will know it was them. This is where people will be coming in in the morning. Okay, so everyone's going to be staggered when they come in. That's important because we don't want them to ever meet their teammates face to face. The original experiment gave guards anonymity by providing mirrored sunglasses and uniforms. But we're taking it much further. Our study will take place in a room that is pitch black. They'll be taken into this room. Ah, I would love to see how dark this room is going to be tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. You ready? I'm ready. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. This is uncomfortable. Despite the darkness, we will be able to see everything, thanks to infrared cameras. The second element is depersonalization. You are going to be participant number one today. From the moment the subjects arrive, they will only be identified by number, not name. So come on in. To eliminate the demand characteristics, we don't want our subjects to know what we're studying. Follow the sound of my voice if you can. All they'll be told is that we are studying how they solve puzzles in the dark. There is another team in a different location who is also solving a puzzle. Okay. Because the words guard and prisoner suggest certain expected behaviors, we've done away with them and will simply give our participants an unseen, distantly located opposing team. We will measure the cruelty predicted by the standard narrative of the Stanford Prison Experiment by giving our participants a way to exercise the third element, power. What I'm going to show you next is the system by which you can send them a loud voice. Okay. So if you want We've to... armed the teams with a distractor button that they can press to blast an extremely loud, jarring noise into the other team's room. Everyone will have a volume dial that ranges from level 1 to 12, and they'll be told that anything below a 7 should be safe for the other team's hearing. And each person has their own control. Okay. So they can't see what you're doing, you can't see what they're doing. Okay. The intensity level they select, as well as the frequency with which they push the button, will be our indicator of how aggressive the participants become in this situation. Is it, is it pretty, like... Terrible to hear. Uh, I'll give you a demonstration. Hey, Derek, could you play um, a level three for me? That's a three. It's pretty, it's pretty loud. Yeah. Okay. Participants will be told that when they or a member of their team pushes a distractor button, the volume played in the opponent's room will be determined by the highest level selected on any of their teammates' dials. This is to increase the feeling of diffused responsibility. The question is, will any of these participants take advantage of these factors and act sadistically? Of course, we would never want anyone to actually be harmed in our experiment. So, the other team? They don't exist. Instead, Jared and I will be the ones occasionally blasting the group with noise at a safe level no higher than a three. To see just how powerful the situation can be, we selected participants who would not be predisposed to sadism. We screened our participants using the Big Five Personality Scale, the Personality Assessment Inventory, and picked those who scored the highest in moral categories, like honesty and conscientiousness. It looks like, you know, they should be able to see each other, but it's pitch dark. There are puzzle pieces on the table in front of you. Thank you, and once I leave the room, you may begin. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so I think all the pieces around the outer... On the edge. Yeah, and yeah. then there's kind of like a frame that they all go in. Yeah, you got like, I don't even know where to begin, man. This is, this is definitely a shot in the dark. Right 
a long piece that definitely don't think they're conscious of the control panel at this point they're no trying to get focused on the task here a long piece that kind of is like an s shape if anyone feels anything like that uh, distractions really missed right. so absurd i had her play it for me just so annoying yeah. <laughs> When it when do that to my work center. Right, right. Exactly. We picked people who were most likely to have these kinds of personalities. Is there like an efficient way for us to work together? Nobody has won yet, right? No. no. Believe me, you'll know when I. Right. <laughs> I think we should send them one at like level one. Oh, she wants. But everybody has to get one, otherwise it goes to like the higher. All right. She's firing. I'm at one. I'm at one, I'm going to. All right, now there's a button to the right. Did somebody do it already? I yeah. did, yeah. I don't... Okay. We should retaliate. Yeah, retaliate yeah. now. Yes, yes, yes. Um, all right, that wasn't too far. I was late for like a 12. <laughs> I really like the idea of describing them, but they're so. I'm just going to put it out there that I'm ready to throw in the towel when ever everyone else is. <laughs> <laughs> Now, they're not retaliating against that um, most recent buzz. Should we try again? These two are kind of like... Jesus. Despite the factors making it easy for them to do so, this team doesn't appear to be turning evil. Now they are like, just deal with it. Just ignore it. They're right. working together. They're not interested in retaliating. I guess another thing we could do with literally like rub the piece. Over the course of the two hour study, we blasted them with noise 23 times. Keep pressing it over and over and over. <laughs> I think it's the biggest asshole. <laughs> but they only pushed the button six times and never above a level five. They didn't seem to abuse their power. Puzzle pieces down. What would happen if we introduced demand characteristics that encouraged them to act aggressively? Your team has been randomly assigned an experimental condition. Although the other team will continue working on a puzzle, your team will not. Your only task is to operate the distractors. Also, the other team's buttons have been disconnected without their knowledge. You will not hear any sounds that they buzz back at you. We introduced the social roles where there's a little bit of power differential. We're kind of mimicking the Stanford-like variables here. By now saying that the buzzer is their task, the participants may feel a greater license to use it liberally, similar to how instructing prison guards in the original experiment to act tough may have encouraged more use of force. Do you guys find a lot of these focus groups? Yeah, yeah I try, try to do them time. every so often. Even though they were given instructions to distract the other team, these participants instead just started chatting with one another. They know that they can be distracting now, but they're not pushing the buzzer. No. You could be pressing the sugar. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Same thing. I'm going to give them a couple of threes. <laughs> a couple of threes. How did you guys find this? Over the course of 10 minutes, this group only pushed the button three times. Can you give them a buzz? Why do you think they're so uninterested in blasting the other teams? Because we have individuals who have been selected really with that predisposition. Right? These are these are individuals who shouldn't be interested in retaliating. It was time to debrief the participants on what we were actually studying. I'm going to turn the lights on. Here I am. I'm Michael, and this is Jared. We're going to debrief you on what was really happening today. There are no other people. You are the only four here at this moment. There was never another team doing anything. It's getting better, though. This is a study related to the Stanford Prison Experiment. Nice. The standard narrative we hear about that experiment is that people just become cruel. So yeah, we're trying to see if we get the nicest people we can and we give them complete anonymity and the ability to be cruel, but never encourage them to, will they still do it? And you guys didn't. 
did you have any suspicions about what we were studying or what was yeah, going on? Yeah, about it. yeah. So we, we just said there was no one else, and there was yeah. more about how we reacted to being blasted and then also having the choice. Right, but that's I think that's good. We, we just want to make sure you don't think that what we're really looking at is how high you turn your own dial. That's really what we're looking at. It was time to bring in our second group of participants who, like the first group, were screened to be individuals with high morality characteristics. Anything up to seven should be safe. Oh my God, this is so weird. <laughs> yeah. So once I leave, you can go ahead and get started. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and this, hmm. Remember, we can distract the other team, too. Yeah. This is an already distracting enough. <laughs> Oh. All right, so at this point, we'd to distract them. <laughs> right off the bat, she went to seven and pushed the button. Yeah. Number two's pushing it at a three. That was so scary. <laughs> okay, here comes number two. Number two. Is still at a set at a three. Volume so. three. This team seemed more willing to retaliate. Let's see what will happen if we continue buzzing them. Will they escalate their behaviors? Derek, let's blast them again. Number three. Oh. Okay, let's let's. I'm gonna hit this over there. Or All right. So two just pushed at a three. Three. But she's not touching the dial. She's not. It's so weird. There's no difference if you. It's annoying. Close your eyes or open them. It's really weird. Okay, I'm not going to release this finger on this button. <laughs> All right. You do that, and we'll try to get. Is there anything fit? It was clear that participant number two was really the only one hitting the distractor button, but it appeared that she only did it in retaliation to our buzzes. So we decided to see what would happen if we laid off. I think this puzzle is possible. <laughs> it's been probably four or five minutes and we have not blasted them with the noise and they haven't played one either. So. Never want to do a puzzle ever again. Uh. I mean, I have a feeling like if we never played a noise in their room, they would never touch the distractor button. Probably not at this point. In the end, we buzzed this group a total of 44 times, and they buzzed us 38 times, 37 of which came from number two, but always in retaliation and never above a five. All right, guys. Puzzle pieces down. Uh. The situational factors did not seem to be sufficient to make this group sadistic. It was time for phase two. So basically she's saying that we could just press the button. That's it? Yeah. I think so. Oh, is she? Yeah. Looks like it's at seven. So wow. Yeah, she's she's going nuts. nuts at a seven. I have come to conclude that there is no other team. They're not as my final answer. So number three believes there is no other team. That might explain why she was just going nuts on the button, because she doesn't feel bad about it. Okay, they're all pushing the button a lot more, and they were told this time that it was their only task. You did, so you did it. Are you happy? You're <laughs> broken, mate. <laughs> That's how frustrating you are. What a difference this has made. Just like in the Stanford Prison Experiment, if you tell people that they have a certain task to do, they'll do it, even if it's going to mean that they've been broken. The thing is, they never hit upon what we really care about, which is turning the dial into an unsafe level. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm going to turn the lights on in this room. Okay. And slowly, okay. you can look. So, uh -oh. hello, I'm Michael, and this is Jared. Hi. I'll give you time to adjust your eyes. Today, you've been part of a study where all we wanted was to see what would happen when we put people in a room and gave them that feeling of anonymity that comes from, well, if I crank my dial up really high, no one will know it's me. Right. So you have this opportunity to be cruel. I thought I went nuts. Like, 
when the other person was fresh. Sure, but that's that's just in kind retribution. As it turns out, so far everyone stays in that below seven seven or under range. Yeah. This final phase was us trying to ramp up the demand characteristics, and I believe number one, right? You did say at one point, you've broken me, I did it, fine. So I love that phrase, because it says, I didn't want to do this, yeah. but I'm doing it because I believe it was expected of me. Yeah. Thank you. After dismissing our participants, Jared and I sat down to discuss our results. Really fascinating. We brought in people who had very different personalities than those Zimbardo chose. We put them in a situation that did not demand things from them, and they behaved according to that personality. I think we have some intriguing support for the idea that it's more than just the situation. We really saw personality kind of shine through. For the most part, they seem to be aware of where that line is yeah. that they shouldn't cross, and they didn't. None of them did.